The way we lead impacts the way people live. This world needs truly human leadership. What we are going to do is we're going to up our game. We're going to show that you can operate with people and performance in total harmony, not one in sacrifice of the other. You do not have to sacrifice your people in order to have top quartile financials. So that is where we are going, and we're going to prove that. I need you all to hold us accountable for that. I'm Brent Stewart, your host. Thanks for listening. This podcast is an outreach of Barry Waymiller. You can find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter at Barry Waymiller. And find our podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. Barry Waymiller CEO Bob Chapman and his son, Barry Waymiller President Kyle Chapman, recently spoke at an event for the St. Louis chapter of the Association for Corporate Growth. The topic was on family business and family business transition, but Bob and Kyle turned it into something more. On this week's podcast, we're going to bring you an edited version of Bob and Kyle's remarks. It's a summary of what has made Barry Waymiller the more than $3 billion company it is today, while also looking ahead to the company we're becoming and will become. It is also a challenge to the business world to be a force for good, because we're working every day to show that people, purpose, and performance can work in harmony to provide value for all stakeholders, not one in sacrifice of the other. Now, here's Kyle and Bob Chapman. Barry Wambler is undergoing a major transformation, a major transformation of leadership, a major transformation of growth, and really the most important part is a major transformation on the impact we're trying to have in the world. And that's what we want you all to walk away with, to show how we can be an example of how business can be a source for goodness in the world versus brokenness. So what we're going to talk to you about today are these three things and a little bit about how we got here, right? What, what was our journey here? And, and talk to you about the benefits of a bit of the business model that we've created, how it's worked in the Great Recession, the Great Pandemic, and our path forward. And then we'll open it up for some questions. So these transformational things we're working on are not coming without obstacles, right? Anytime you are running a family business, and you're thinking about transition, you're facing a few things. Now, the good thing is that family businesses are a critical part of our global economy, of our US economy. I think it's like 60% of GDP, 60-ish percent of the workforce, hiring uh, about 70-ish percent. That's amazing. But when you dig down and get deeper into the statistics, well, 40% of family businesses don't have a very good succession plan. About 30% make it from first generation to second generation and about 12% make it from second generation to third generation. Those statistics suck in my, where I'm standing right now, right? So, you know, my grandfather, William Chapman, took over the business in the mid 60s. So technically he's the first generation, then quickly in the 70s passed to my dad, second generation. So number three CEO in the world, that's great. Best selling author, pretty cool you know, kind of coming in as, you know, unranked. <laughs> I've been, I, I don't read that much and I don't write very well, but um, so there's no, no pressure for me here. But that's okay, I enjoy a good bit of pressure. I, I, the, the shadow that my dad casts doesn't make me too cold at night. So it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to have the honor to, to attempt to take this into the third generation and I'll explain some ways how I'm trying to break that mold a bit. When you think about the growth we're trying to pursue, Barry Waymiller has been an M&A centric business. We used to be weekly in the headlines about businesses we were buying. We've bought over 115 companies. We've deployed over a billion dollars of capital, right? Most of the businesses we bought over time have been broken or underperforming and we breathe life back into those businesses with our business strategies. We breathe life back into those communities. But the M&A market is changing, right? It's not as easy at three billion to go out and buy a bunch of businesses that create scale, right? We have private equity that's you know, infiltrated our, our, our business, driven up market valuations to 12 to 14 times. I mean, 
We bought businesses you couldn't multiply EBITDA because there wasn't any, <laughs> right? So the multiple would have been infinite. And at $3 billion for us to buy businesses, we have to go into larger transactions, which creates a different level of risk. So there's another headwind in our transformation, right? Transitioning a family business, going from M&A, we've got to figure out a different way to grow than we have in the past. And the biggest obstacle to our transformation is this. Work is the leading cause of stress in the world, and stress is the leading cause of heart attacks. So we are actually hurting our people. Most people um, would say that their supervisor is more important to their health than their primary care physician. In fact, most folks would forego a pay raise in order to fire their boss. <laughs> that is sad, right? Think about the environment that we're in right now. So we're trying to go out that business can be the most powerful source for good in the world if we would embrace the awesome responsibility of leadership. If we could just simply show the people that, are, that we have the privilege to lead that we can care for them, we can change the view of business. So those are the obstacles we're facing at this pretty big pivot point in our organization. And uh, we're up for the challenge, I believe. So I'll walk you, I'll, give, I'll step back a little bit. Dad, anything you wanted to say on, on this? Well, I'd say to this audience, m and deal people? Do you consider the people in the organizations that you're looking at acquiring, and do you look at them and say you can give them a better future? Do you look at the people or the deal or the economics? So we really, uh, we want to be able to adopt new companies and tell them that they have a better future with us. And, and quite often people cry when we buy their company because they can't believe they finally get to work for a company that cares about them. Unfortunately, again, we launched uh, the Foresight Partners, because I was concerned that this focus on buying it at a dollar, selling it for four dollars, leveraging your capital, flipping it, was destroying this country. I remember, 88% of all people in this country feel they work for an organization that does not care about them. Okay, those are your kids, your parents, your friends, your neighbors. Okay, and, and again, as Kyle said, 65% of all people would give up a salary increase if they could fire their boss. Okay, why do you want your kids to go into business someday and be bought by one of your companies and bought and flipped and stripped, okay? So, you know, uh, I would say to you that we have seen this evolution to truly I mean, leadership as a powerful force for good in the world because we have people in our care for 40 hours a week. So when you look at your deals, can you look at the people in that organization you're acquiring saying, under our care, you have a better future? That's, that's the standard of care I'd like you to think about. Absolutely. Well, thanks. Well, let's set some context for who we are. Barry Wambler can be viewed as a very complex organization. I like to keep it simple. We, we operate five platforms with kind of a growing consulting platform, Chapman & Co. We have some uh, participants here today. But we, we operate three equipment businesses and one service business, and then we have uh, BW Foresight Partners. The equipment that we make fills caps, label C's. That's our uh, packaging equipment. We touch everything that you all touch our, we uh, manufacture everything that you all touch on a daily basis. We also make equipment, it's in our paper system division, division, that makes corrugated box board. So we actually make the corrugated board, we fold it, we print it. I'm sure you've seen some of those on your doorsteps from Amazon. We also have a big converting platform where we make equipment that makes toilet paper. We like to call it bathroom tissue, it makes it a little more sophisticated. But it's a it's well, a fantastic. Well, we probably said hello to you this morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have a design group, which is our engineering consulting firm, where we go out and advise some of the largest organizations on setting up manufacturing facilities, et cetera. I want to, because you're all St. Louisans, and most of you know Emerson Electric, in my youth, I studied uh, Emerson Electric, Chuck Knight, for years. I studied how he bought companies. Etc. So he was my business model mentor, and, and the word balance came from Emerson Electric's intense focus on balance. So we're going to speak a lot about balance, but as you can see, um, we have this platform. But when I think about it, a third of our business comes from highly engineered equipment, a third of our business comes from supporting that equipment out in the field, and a third of our business is in consulting services. I've got a simple brain, I can wrap my mind around that. What we do in each market is up to our local leaders. So that's when you think about our business and our business strategy, that's really what we do. 
You know, we have over 100 locations across the world um, in 28 different countries. Uh, we are, you know, we like to consider ourselves builders of people and business, and we're trying to reinforce it. And you can run organizations with people and performance and harmony, not one in sacrifice of the other. So we're going to spend a lot more time on that. I'll add to that. I was interviewed by Washington University professors, organizational development professors, a few years ago. Hour and a half interview. At the end of the interview, they said, you're the first CEO I've ever talked to that never talked about your product. And I said, I've been talking about our product for the last hour and a half. It's our people. I won't go to the grave proud of the machinery we build. I'll go to my grave proud of the people who built that machinery. So our focus is on our people. It's called people, purpose, and performance. It starts with our responsibility to your kids who may work for us someday or your friends or colleagues around a purpose that inspires them, and then we have to create value. So it's the three Ps, people, purpose, and performance. But it all starts with people, not numbers. So how did we get here, right? This has been a long journey. And so it was recently doing this because we just had a record year and kind of reflecting on the fact that this record year has been decades in the making. Right, and so there's a couple uh, pivot points for Barry Wayne was had in the past. So there's this pre-IPO phase, which there's a Harvard case study written on it. But in 1987, Dad took a, a public took a part of our business and spun it off. But before that, uh, Dad learned a lot of his leadership skills or management skills. It was brute force management. He had a sick company serving a sick market with concentrated customers. He was able to find elements of growth, areas that he thought would be pretty profitable, that ended up coming back and biting him. In the mid-80s, he lived payroll to payroll and was able to kind of get a piece of business together that somebody else valued more than he did, fortunately, and it saved the organization. In that up and down, in that fighting in payroll, he learned many of the lessons that kind of started, that uh, fed our strategies going forward. In 1986, we were about 55 million in sales, pretty weak. I started doing acquisitions with no money. So what do you buy when you have no money? Things nobody else wants, okay? And so I patched together some acquisitions, had about a $35 million, 35 of our 55 million. And my English team came over and said, maybe we could spin off our part of the business, which was the acquisitions, and we, you could pay down your debt, because I couldn't borrow $5 million uh, uh, at the time. And so we, put to get, we patched those companies together we'd bought that were extremely unattractive businesses, <clears throat> and uh, put them together and had a massively successful IPO on the London Stock Exchange. It was so phenomenal that Harvard wrote a case study on it that I began teaching. And, and so we put together a group of companies. And so the company that Kyle uh, is talking about today was really reborn in 1988 after that public offering. And uh, basically, I would say to you, I sat down for probably nine months, counted the $28 million I had in the bank because I couldn't believe it, had no debt, and I had a chance to do it again. So I designed a business model from the mistakes and experiences I had in the 80s that now reflects the company that we're talking about today. So we had a chance to begin again, but now we had some money, no debt, and some experience. So the, the, the company we have today uh, it, was, it was, again, the historic bottle washer and pasteurizer business that did not, was not part of the public offering. And it, that was the foundation. Then we had $28 million in the bank and no debt. So that's, that's where we began, $20 million in 1988. So I, I always appreciate pausing at that milestone <coughs> because it becomes a bit self-serving for me. This is where I like to say the real Barry Wamler was built. So this is, that makes dad first generation and me second generation. So the statistics are three times as likely we're gonna succeed. So I like to think about Barry Wamler 1.0 as some other business that I had nothing to do with. So um, as dad said, he spent about six months counting the money, I mean setting strategy uh, for the business going forward. Right, and so what he had learned is having a single product line, single technology, single customer is not a great business strategy. And instead, he wanted to build a $100 million packaging equipment business built on balance of customers, markets, technologies, and price points. And so he started doing that. Probably the original strategic plan of Barry Wamler and what we wanted to become. And that happened in the late 80s and in through the 90s. But it, as we got into the late 90s, if anyone's read the book, Everybody Matters, 
you'll see that he started having a series of epiphanies. One of the ones was in the late 90s with a customer service team. We realized that business could be fun if we incented them, if they got excited about work. Just like people get excited about watching March Madness, we made competitive games, et cetera. That was one of my dad's early signs of what it could be by giving back to people. So then as we moved into the 2000s, right, <coughs> we um, started diversifying. Now, I wouldn't say it was intentional diversification. We were opportunistic diversification. We got into that corrugating market I talked to you about. We got into the tissue market that I've talked about. We launched BW Forsyth Partners. But the really cool thing that was going on in the early 2000s through the late, because it's really important, is our cultural momentum was building. We launched our guiding principles of leadership. We launched a university to teach people to listen, how to care, how to lead, right? And so that was all building up. And we all know what happened in 2008, 2009, right? The Great Recession. We could have easily thrown away a decade's worth of work through our actions, and we didn't. Instead, we, we made every decision through the filter of what it meant to measure success by the way we touch the lives of people. And that's how we did all of our decisions in the Great Recession. I'll show you later how we, how we bounced out of that. When I, I cannot remember an acquisition I ever brought to our board that they liked. <laughs> uh, seriously. Uh, and so, uh, and, and the corrugated business, which is now our largest business, you know, that was, somebody brought us an opportunity to look at this company in northern Wisconsin that was in bankruptcy, uh, made a corrugated machine, machines that make corrugated box board. You know, about, hundred, uh, about an $88 million business. And I really said, no, no, I'm not interested. And they said, oh, Bob, you could, you could really help this company. I said, no, 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 we're in packaging. We're, I'm stay focused in packaging. So Bob, you got to look at it. And they got a runway right at the end of the plant. You could be up there and back in one day. I said, okay, well, we'll take a look at it. We flew up there in five minutes. We knew we could fix it. And, and we bought it. And I went to my board. And my most senior board member at the time was a guy named Bob Lanigan, who was chairman of Owens, Illinois, on the Chrysler Daimler board. And Bob looked at me and said, Bob, nobody makes money in corrugated box board because corrugated box board follows manufacturing. So don't, you know, don't do it. I said, Bob, I'm going to do it, and you're going to like it. <laughs> what, what Kyle's describing is what I would call a very eclectic journey. There's no business case, no, no MBA program that would ever say, go out and buy broken companies and put them together and create something great. So our eclectic journey in acquisitions, I felt I knew what I was good at. I was good at fixing companies that were challenged, so I needed to do what I did well. OK, at the same time, Kyle's starting to talk about our culture. Our culture was just as eclectic. It wasn't a book we read. It wasn't somebody came in to fix anything. And so the, what you're going to see today is this picture of a very eclectic parallel journey from putting together these businesses that now look phenomenal in hindsight, but at the time looked kind of challenging. Why would you buy a bunch of broken businesses, put them together, and have something great? But again, most of the companies, uh, up until Kyle joined us and Ryan where we got into buying companies with a, a better future, I would say to you, were uh, very challenged. Family businesses quite often pr failed private equity investments. And we'd walk in and we would fix them. So we have never moved. We never bought a company and shut down and moved it to a low-cost country. You know, we, we take a look at the people, and we, we are very committed to the people. So very eclectic journey. Go ahead. So, uh, so eclectic, we started uh, really scaling up uh, in the late 2000s. We snapped out of the Great Recession because we had our entire uh, employee base still intact. We didn't let anyone go. Um, and we started building scale. Also, our culture was gaining so much momentum, somebody told Dad he should write a book. Dad doesn't, also doesn't read many books, so he decided to write one. Um, but this was when you do that, you really set the tone for your culture. You can't go back, right? It is written down. People can read it and say, hey, what happened to chapter six, right? And so that's really what galvanized where we're going. Now, this is where I started chirping a little bit more to my dad. I said, dad, the only way people are going to read your book is if we're performing at a top level as well. If we, if we mess around with below average margins and below average performance and aren't great innovators, People are going to say, oh, I now know why. You can't afford that because you're too nice to your people. I'm just going to add, I'm going to add a little color to that. Uh, Tim Sullivan, my partner uh, you know, in, in developing this, 
we, we never, you could never tell a multiple of EBITDA in a deal we made because they didn't have any EBITDA, okay? So, so we never talked about EBITDA multiples, and our operating uh, EBITDA performance wasn't important to us because we had this unique EVA methodology for developing our share price. So our share price appreciation was spectacular because we were getting tremendous returns on our investment. But if you looked at it optically, like most people do, well, what's your EBITDA percentage? You know, how good are you and what's your growth? We didn't, we didn't look as good from that angle, but we never looked at that angle because we had this measure that our shareholders like, which is EVA methodology. So that, that was the reason we didn't see what, so Kyle comes in kind of from the professional field and says, Dad, you know, people are gonna say, yeah, I, I could be nice to my people if I only wanted to make 7% EBITDA, okay? And so we realized that we needed to take our game up to validate our culture. That became the inspiration to us because if, if you can't create human and economic value and harmony, people say, yeah, I'd like to be nice to my people, but I can't perform like that. Yeah, and you can see over that day, I mean, it's not like we were doing bad things, right? We doubled our <coughs> business from two, 2008 to 2009. But we launched what's called our step change era, where we are really focused on driving home people and performance in harmony, not one in sacrifice to the other. That is how people usually do it. I either have to be great to my people and thus don't care about profits, or I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna be ruthless about making earnings and no matter what I have to do to our people. Uh, our share price has gone up over 14% a year for 25 years in a row. So we were feeling good even though Kyle came in and said, you're not as good as you think you are because you're not performing at the levels of the industry. And we said, well, look, it, there's no reason if we have a great culture that allows people to share their best talents with us, we shouldn't perform above the industry standard to, to further validate our culture to many people. So again, this is just a benchmark to say we're not a nonprofit organization, okay? We're a value-creating organization, but both human and economic value in harmony. So it took Dad a few Thanksgiving dinners to uh, get over me telling him his baby was ugly, but he, got, he eventually got over it and got on He's board. my baby. Yeah. That's also a good point. <laughs> I walked right into that one, didn't I? Yeah. Um, so this is just a scoreboard. It's cr critical, but you've got to have multiple scores, right? Our, our share price was going up. There were other metrics. So we were getting a bit insular in how we were looking at this business, and so we started looking elsewhere. So... Now that you have an understanding of who we are and how we got here, I want to talk a bit more about balance, right? So that's been so critical to us, especially in a couple of the major disruptions in our economy that we've had. One, as you can see, Dad in the 80s, as he talked about, he had one product line, one technology, one market, and it was all struggling, right? Let me, so let me, let me amplify that. Our largest customer was Anheuser-Busch. It was our first customer in 1901. We, had, we were getting all their businesses, they were growing, and one day a gentleman retired from engineering and a person was promoted from within, and he decided that that 100-year relationship needed to change. And overnight, we lost our largest company. We did nothing different. A gentleman retired, and all of a sudden, we lost 40% of our business. So I just said, I will never put our people in that position again, ever because there's nothing I could do about it, okay? And so I, would, I recovered, I mean, I, I made it through, uh, but that's why it amplified the work that Chuck Knight had shared with me uh, in terms of balance. But when we think about balance, again, we pursued things that other people didn't necessarily like or see value in, or was it the sexiest thing that we've ever, ever invented, right? We're not that big of a technology company. So I'm gonna put some images up here you know, what do all these things have in common, right? A, they're boring as all get out, right? Toilet paper, brown boxes, face masks, cans, pet food, semiconductor chips. The other thing is that they all were deemed incredibly essential during the pandemic and have been exploding in terms of the demand for each and every one of these things. The last thing they have in common is they all come off our equipment or they all have to do something with our uh, services, um, our consulting services. So in the pandemic, we have just come off a record year. And it's because of the balance and the business model that we put in place. That's one. We serve great markets. They may be boring, but they're stable, right? They're growing. They're global. <clears throat> the really cool thing about what's gone on in the pandemic is how our culture has taken hold yet again. The way people cared for each other during this pandemic to keep our business healthy and protect the safety of our people. We were building machines 
for Clorox, sanitary wipes, getting a special incentive by the White House to get them out in a faster timeline, all at the time when COVID was raging. So our team members had to go show in, build machines, arm in arm, and get it done. It showed incredible creativity, flexibility, and dedication. We didn't have to force them to go do it. It happened organically. We had our German organization who makes mailing on envelope equipment. You can imagine how good that market was when the pandemic was going. They didn't sit still. They showed incredible agility, creativity. They spun up a face mask machine in 90 days and sold $16 million worth of it. Unbelievable creativity. Why? Because they wanted to do right by the business. When I think about what we experienced this year, right, would we have experienced the same robust growth, the creativity, the agility with a bunch of unfulfilled team members? A bunch of people that were worried more about themselves than the broader good of the organization? No, we wouldn't have. And so what we've experienced this year just brings incredible joy to us, um, but it's not by accident, right? Intentional culture, intentional business model. We're very involved in the can industry and aluminum cans in terms of global sustainability have determined they're much more environmentally friendly than plastic bottles. And so the demand for cans is record. So our single largest customer this year during the COVID was the can industry who can't buy enough cans. So, so there's several, and then e-commerce, you know, um, you can't make enough boxes right now for uh, all the overnight shipment of corrugated box ports. So that market that my director told me not to get in is exploded. So it's great to have a balanced and <coughs> diversified business model, but if it doesn't perform at the worst of times, what's the point? Uh, during that 08, 09 downturn, we made less money, we didn't lose money, and we didn't let anyone go. All of our competitors lost significant amounts of money uh, and our uh, share price went up 11% in 0809. Yep. Okay, so uh, I would say to you, our business model was, our culture and our business model were tested in 0809, the worst economic shock, and we came out really strong. Yeah. So as we look forward, you know, we, we really start talking about building a legacy, right? And so as I talked about the transition we're going through right now, so um, I've been uh, president for about a year, and you would think, just given our intentional diversification and intentional culture, we'd have an intentional succession plan. We didn't. Uh, that shouldn't be a shock to you all. So I was off on my merry way. Uh, I was in private equity on the dark side. Uh, sorry, Holly. Um, and uh, learning a bunch of new business models and things and, and then went to a private equity owned business and felt the, that pressure of being owned by private equity and short termism and things like that. And out of the blue was asked to come back and start BW Foresight Partners. What it ultimately ended up doing was providing a great leadership development opportunity to go buy and build organizations. And so the whole idea of Foresight Partners is what if we could combine the best of private equity with the best of our truly human leadership strategic investing. And so the hybrid equity evolved from that. Absolutely. And in the early days, there was a big sucking noise from us, from Barry Wamler, taking whatever <laughs> strategy and resources we could. But you know, we've done 40 acquisitions ourselves and we've grown about to 750 million. And we started, that's when my dad said, Kyle started saying, hey, your EBITDA margins could be higher. We started bringing things back into Barry Waymler. So about five years ago, I was my dad's strategic finance partner. That was just a nice way of saying, I got to say a lot of things, but had no operating responsibility whatsoever. And people didn't have to listen to me. But was able to point out real opportunities for growth and performance improvement. And about two years ago, Dad said, all right, well, let's put your money where your mouth is. Come in and serve as interim CFO. I was like, okay, well, I can, I can give that a go. So we set a whole agenda of where we're going to take the business forward. That was January of 2020. We all know what happened in March of 2020. Now, what's interesting about the pandemic is that it provided this really unique opportunity to be thrust in front of the organization. Right? I was controlling cash. I was looking at all the metrics about what was going well, what was not, and we were doing daily communication to the world. <coughs> and so over that eight month period, we were very lucky. There were a couple of dark days where we were like, is this world ending, right? Are we gonna, are orders gonna stop? And they didn't. April, May, everything started coming and we performed quite well over that period of time. I found a very capable CFO, he's in the crowd today, so uh, Mike Menarchy, who uh, joined and I said, dad, what's next? 
what do you want me to do? I'll go back to Forsyth Partners, whatever. And he said, Actually, well. Actually, that's not really what happened. That's, that's really what happened. <laughs> That's what happened. No, no, Don't let facts get in the way of a good story. Actually, the board came to me uh, and said, Bob, you've got to let Kyle step up into it. I mean, Kyle had earned so much respect from the board over this 10-year period and what he did with Foresight. that The board came to me uh, and said, you've you got to let Kyle step up into a bigger role. I said, great. So it was the board's idea uh, that we promote Kyle to president and I become CEO. So it was beautiful, it was a perfect transition for Kyle. All right. He is the control <laughs> shareholder and uh, chairman of the board, so. <laughs> but he's right, it was the board's idea. But, so the transition is going well. We are, you know, I'm, I have the great fortune of working with my dad, you know, mentor, best friend, business, you know, you know whatever, superhero. Uh, and all wrapped up in one guy that I get to work with. So I'm, it's going incredibly well. I'd give him an A, not quite an A plus. There's still some days he snaps back, but <laughs> it's going really well. I'm just a simple accountant from yeah. Ferguson. So, but the key is, right, if people don't believe that I can take on the legacy that he's built, that's really my goal, is to make sure his, leg his legacy extends well beyond his time and we can show that business is a force for good. If I can't do that, that I'm not doing my job. And so when we think about where we're going next, we talk a lot about what we're gonna change. Well, what's not gonna change? One, our why, the filter through which we make all of our decisions, we measure success by the way we touch the <coughs> lives of people, is not going to change. Not as long as I have the privilege of leading. But what we are gonna do is we're gonna up our game. We're gonna show that you can operate with people and performance in total harmony, not one in sacrifice of the other. You do not have to sacrifice your people in order to have top quartile financials. So that is where we are going, and we're gonna prove that. I need you all to hold us accountable to that because that's what, that's what our goal is. And the other part is when we think about expanding, when we think about taking our culture outside of our four walls, I need to do this so that my dad and others can do this. We have a lot to share with the world, and we've got to have people believing in our business model, who we are and where we're going in order to do it. And so what we like to talk about is that our business model is this kind of robust Ferrari engine, right? But you can't put like, you know, crappy fuel in your engine. You actually, actually, our, our culture is the premium fuel that makes the business model, the engine, perform at its highest level, right? It's not because we have a great culture we do well. It's not because we have a bus great business model we do well. It's yeah, a combination yeah, to of To add both. to that, I was up at Harvard where they're introducing the Barry Wimler. So Harvard, about six years ago, five years ago, wrote a case study on our culture. I believe now all Harvard MBA students study Barry Wimler's culture. I was just up there last week teaching. And I went up there when I was introduced to a group of about this size, 100, 160 global executives came in for a, about a month long uh, leadership event at uh, Harvard and they used our case study. So I sat in there as they were discussing from the night, the study they did the night before, they discussed it for a good hour, hour and a half. And at the end, uh, Jan Rifkin, the chair of the MBA program said to this group, is Barry Wimler successful because of its culture or its strategy? And again, I was just sitting there, I hadn't said a word. I, you know, Jan didn't tell me what he was gonna ask me. And so, Jan, they, they discussed it for about 10 minutes more, and then they voted. 75% of the people said, Barry Wim was successful because of our culture. So I stood up in front of this group of very prominent global executives, and I said, I understand why you think that's true, but it's not. Barry Wim was successful because we built a robust business model in the 1990s and we stayed true to that model, which is balance and, and, and prudence. And, but the culture is the premium fuel that went into that to amplify that. So I would say, I want you to go away. You, our focus is on, do you have a business strategy that gives your people a grounded sense of hope for the future? Because if you don't design your business model right, you're going to hurt people. Some people say it's about getting the right people on the bus. I don't agree with that. I believe it's about building a safe bus, which is your business model. And then you need drivers who are your leaders who know how to drive it and, get, and know where they're going. And then anybody you invite on the bus is going to be fine. But 
our primary responsibility as leaders is to design a safe business model that gives our people a chance to raise kids, buy a home, live life in some sense of safety and comfort. We live in an environment of downsizing, right-sizing, restructuring, and it is causing a high level of stress and anxiety in this country. The statistics Kyle said earlier, that's because of us, okay? Because it's all numbers. And, and the key is uh, focus on making sure that we're doing the right thing for the people we have the privilege of leading. The privilege, not the job of leading, the privilege of leading. So you in this room could help heal this country. Because remember, prior to the pandemic, we had the lowest unemployment in 50 years, we had a strong economy, and we weren't sending young men and women out to war in the world. Yet we had the highest level of anxiety and depression we've ever had. Why? We had peace and prosperity. Why would we have anxiety and depression? Because people feel used for somebody else's purpose. They don't feel cared for. That's what statistics say. It never occurred to me in my education, nor in my experience through Young Presidents Organization, all the other organizations, that the way we run our businesses would affect the way people go home and treat their spouse, their kids, and their health. So when you think about what you all are doing in your various roles in this field, are you caring for people as much as you care for the numbers? Are you giving the people, if you get a chance to step in and acquire a company, can you give them a better future, okay? Can you look them in the eye and say, together we can do good things, now let's go do it. So that's the standard of care we're trying to bring to business. The beauty is you in this room, if everybody in the country in your role in this room would embrace a human side, not just an economic side, we could heal the brokenness that we're sending our kids out to. Absolutely, so that's <laughs> probably the biggest lesson you could take away. So I know that, Amy, I think, I know we went over time, so just to be clear, and uh, really appreciate all of your all's time listening to our story. Hold us accountable to everything that we're saying. We're at a pretty cool pivot point in our organization, and just appreciate the opportunity to share it with you. Yeah, Kyle, Bob, that was great. Thank you. Um, you know, obviously, when you hear your story, there's a lot going on, right? How would you assess your abilities individually to hold yourself accountable to the, the values that you're, you know, that, that you're, you know, laying in the foundation of your companies? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a challenge every day, right? We're only as good as the person sitting in the furthest corner in the furthest you know, facility away from us. That's, that's as good as we are on any given day. And if that person isn't feeling our culture, then we're not doing a good enough job. And we're not there yet, honestly. So what would I give us? I don't know, a, a six out of 10? I think we're further than most, but this is gonna be a journey that continues forever. It's honestly, like when you think now, strip all that away, it is easier to run businesses this way. It's easier to run business being nice to people, being open, communicating, right? Doing teamwork, it's simpler. We have overcomplicated business, right? Financial leverage, you know, kind of how, how we're talking about uh, crazy transactions, how you manage people, boss them around. You have the bureaucratic, you know, kind of hierarchies that exist. We have overcomplicated things. It is so much simpler to run a business the way we talk about it because you're just out there operating things you know how to operate, treat, treating people how they want to be treated, and you know working as a team. It's so much simpler. We want to make, believe that we can bring value to the company and give people a better future. That's what drives us. And I would hope all of you would think about that in your deals. Can you look at the people that, you, that you're going to impact and say, we can give you a better future? Or are you just financial engineers? Who, you know, buy assets, strip out costs, flip it for different multiples because that's what's hurting. And these are not the kind of companies you want your kids to go work for someday because people want to feel valued and you have a chance to show them we care about you. Business leaders, do you accept Bob Chapman's challenge? Are you giving your people a grounded sense of hope? Are you becoming and acting as a force for good. Would your children, 
Would you want your children to work for your company? These are all very good questions to look inside and think about. Thanks for listening today. Don't forget to find us and connect on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter at Barry Waymiller. And you can find more podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. I'm Brent Stewart. Thanks again for listening. Take care.